Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to the channel. I am still reeling from Tim Sale's death. That is just, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking as, as a fan. He goes down in the, in the ranks as those like Darwin Cook, George Perez, you know, people that still had a lot to give. They were capable of telling incredible, they, they understood, they, they understood these iconic characters for who they truly were, not just, you know, the nonsense that people are trying to recreate them to today. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to see them, you know, slowly pass on. They're older, although Tim Sale is only 66, that's far too young. But um, what's frustrating about it too, though, is that they could still have been giving us good work, iconic superhero work. They were doing good work, you know, those who still chose to work, but they could have still been giving us a lot more actual DC or Marvel output, but both DC and Marvel just have this attitude right now where they're not hiring. Those guys are old. That's old news. Nah, we'd rather let Scott Snyder and Tom King write everything because that works out so well for them. <clears throat> just, it's, it's infuriating. It's so many, <clears throat> in some cases, great creators who, who are even financially struggling a bit are not doing as well as they would be. If uh, their companies that they'd worked for for so many years and had created so much wonderful, true iconic output w would still hire them on and let them do these runs and whatnot and, and uh, you know, their own continuities or whatever. So it's, so it's frustrating. But I am continuing my, my tribute to Tim Sale. Two of his biggest seminal works for DC, you just can't not mention Superman for All Seasons and Batman The Long Halloween. He did both of those with Jeff Loeb. Although they're not part of the Loeb and Sale uh, color series, they did a sale. Uh, the Tim, the Spider-Man Blue review I just released a little while ago. That was part of this color series where they would take a character. Um, most of those were from Marvel, and they would uh, I think they're all from Marvel, and it would take a point in their origin story, and they would choose a color, and it was re really artistically done thematically. If you haven't seen the Spider-Man Blue review I did, you can go back and check that out. Uh, really great work. Tim Sale really shined in that. But uh, when you mention Tim Sale, you know, people are going to say the, the artist from Superman for All Seasons, the artist from Batman The Long Halloween. And I, I'm not going to ignore that. And I want to re-release in some packaging my, my analyses of those because I teach those in class, actually, in my Heroic Archetypes uh, class, um, Constructing the American Hero. But I have done those re, uh, um, analyses and I've even re-released them in a certain way. I think uh, no more than a year or a year or two ago in certain uh, packages. So I'm going to go ahead and put them on this video lumped together and I'll have in the description below like a menu. So if you want to see the Superman for all seasons, you know, skip straight to that analysis. You can do that. If you want to see the uh, Batman long Halloween analysis, you can skip to that, but I've done more, but I just can't not, not call attention and, and re-showcase those analyses I did of those wonderful works uh, in honor of Tim Sale. I will be looking at one of the, uh, the color series that I haven't, done a proper review of yet is Captain America White, so I will be doing that, but they've done more, and I'll do a whole intro to that, and uh, and we'll talk about that soon. But I will just say this by way of introduction to Superman for All Seasons and The Long Halloween. These were done, uh, I'm forgetting the exact year that Superman for All Seasons was done. I know Batman The Long Halloween was done in the 90s. <clears throat> it was done when that sort of uh, Reboot, the soft reboot of the continuity of Batman was taking place after the Batmania of 89 and whatnot. And even though it was a reboot, this was still the Batman that we've known, known and love. True blue Batman, decade after decade. Even though in the pop, uh, popular consciousness, you know, they'd had the, the Tim Burton, I mean, the uh, Adam West Batman, you know, the theater of the absurd, which was wonderful, dearly loved it. But the, the, the average person on the street got mixed up, like, oh, is Batman a cheesy character or is he a real serious hero? And, it, you know, it was kind of silly. Uh, and then, you know, we got the wonderful Tim Burton movies, although they took him a little bit too dark, you know, and, and, and Miller's influence was certainly taking him too dark and whatnot in the, in the comics here and there. But main continuity, Batman remained the true Batman that he had been for decades upon decades. And Loeb and Sale wrote their... Uh, um, the Long Halloween arc as a as a sequel to Frank Miller's Batman Year One arc. I mentioned that in the uh, in the in the review here. I'm just pointing out the fact that this is a character created in the 40s, and they were writing him an origin story of sorts. You know, it's the origin of of Harvey Dent, Two Face, and whatnot, beginning of Batman's career. They were writing this origin story of sorts in the 90s, and it's still the same character from the 40s to the 90s still the same character. 
Little peripheral things will change here and there, but still the same character. And they recognized enough to really ground it in the film noir uh, feel, you know, of, of the detective fiction and the pulp stuff that Super, uh, Batman came from. Likewise with Superman. Again, I'm blanking on the exact year. It was 90s. Uh, I think it was late 90s. I might be wrong. I haven't looked it up. But uh, around the same time there, anyway, pretty pretty close, that Superman for All Seasons was written, which was a straight-up origin story. Not like a reboot. It was just them doing a special little origin story. Glorious. Glorious. Here's a character, you know, created in, uh, was it 39? Uh, you know me, I'm bad with numbers. I've done projects and written on it and stuff like that. But, uh, but you know, 30s. This character created in the 30s, 38, 39. And here we are in late 90s or whenever Superman for All Seasons was written, and they're telling an origin story, and it's the same character. Of course, they're, you know, adding like a preacher here, adding a couple things here. Like I said, the peripheral, you know, things will change, but don't let people tell you that, oh, these characters, they're malleable. They're always going to change. You know, your Superman didn't kill, mine does. You know, it's all good. They just, they change. That's garbage. That's baloney. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Don't you believe it? <laughs> so, that's not the case. That's not the case when a character is created... And becomes formed, you know, malleable for a little period of time there as the creators listen to the audience feedback. And then that character sets, if it's going to be a mythological character, into what the public needs it to be. And then they use it. They use that character. They draw inspiration from it. That character fulfills its function in society, in our own personal lives and psychologies. And that's how that works. It's not until some idiot like Dio comes in and mandates change, you know, from the top down to turn it all upside down and make it darker. And now we're in this uh, culture now in which we want to reject everything that came from previous generations, good or bad, reject it all because we're our own thing now. We're, we're defining genders. We're defining all these kinds of things that our stupid ancestors never knew what to do with, right? You know, so so there's this push to reject all of the old stories and, and all of the old characters. Hey, the Skywalker saga is over. Let's tell new stories. You know, and what is it getting you? That's getting you the culture and the society we have today. And all the anxieties and, and problems people have today. But uh, just wanted to say that by way of intro. <laughs> Obviously, you can tell I could really roll on with that and make it its own video. Maybe I'll do that. I'll shut up now, though, and I'll get to those two reviews. Superman for All Seasons and Batman The Long Halloween. Like I said, if you just want to cut to one or the other, skip to it or whatever, come back later. Check in the description. I will have a little table of contents of the video for you to uh, take a look at that. But uh, rest in peace, Tim Sale. You've gone too soon and uh, love, love, and always will uh, cherish the work that you left behind for us. So until next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the hero stories you love best. Thanks for watching. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I want to examine the timeless classic Superman for All Seasons. Written by Jeff Loeb and drawn by Tim Sale, this work easily ranks in the top 10 of any self-respecting Superman fan. The standalone tale is a literary telling of Superman's transition from Smallville to Metropolis. I say literary because the scope, character development, and plot are all carefully constructed to support a common theme. Only by connecting with our past can we successfully navigate our future. A portrayal of the iconic Superman is the perfect vehicle for this theme, because Superman wouldn't exist without Smallville and the wholesome upbringing he received from Jonathan and Martha Kent. The story is divided into four chapters, each named after a season. We begin with spring and work our way through winter. Symbolically, that season structure would appear to chronicle the rise and downfall of our hero, his time of blooming, his falling, and his death, metaphorical or otherwise. Spring does see Clark leave for Metropolis. Summer sees his success as Superman. Fall finds Luther orchestrating a profound attack on the hero's confidence. And Winter witnesses him step back from his role as Metropolis' protector. The story doesn't stop there, though. In the midst of winter, his darkest time, he makes the decision to bounce back. By regrouping in Smallville with the faith Lana and the Kents have in him, he doesn't need to wait for the metaphorical spring to come around in his life. With icy snow still covering the rooftops and the seasonal death of winter still covering the earth, he returns triumphant and resumes his place, now unshakable in his belief in who he is and the mission he's embraced. With the transitions in Superman's life, each season provides us with a different narrator as well. Two men and two women from Clark's life tell the story, one each from his past in Smallville and one each from his future in Metropolis. Jonathan Kent narrates the spring. We see his acceptance and support of his son, despite Clark's choice to leave the farm life for the city. We gain insight into Clark's upbringing, the values, struggles, and events that lead to his decision to use his abilities to help others as Superman. 
This foundation is what he returns to in the end to launch himself back into his future. The second male narrator appears in the fall and is Superman's biggest opponent. In a masterfully written internal monologue, Lex Luthor describes Metropolis as an unfaithful lover. He feels betrayed by the city he dragged up from nothing and made great. Betrayed for a younger, brighter spectacle of a man, and he wants his city back. The context of this motive is a brilliant twist to Luthor, while not straying from the usual hubris and jealousy of the character. Lex fulfills the role of an antagonist by displaying traits and motives that are the reverse of the heroes. Whereas Superman lives to serve others and wants a future grown organically from his past, Lex is self-serving and wants his future to revert to his past, placing himself back on top in the public eye of Metropolis. The first female narrator is Lois. Like us, she is now experiencing Superman in Metropolis. Her reaction serves as a stand-in for that of the world in general. Lois believes in the hard truth of life, a world where nobody sticks their neck out for anybody, she says. We lie to each other, we brutalize each other, we kill each other, and here's this man sticking his neck out for everyone, way, way out. Lois wants to react with cynicism, her defense mechanism, but Superman's sincerity and purity breaks through, and she finds herself inspired and enamored with the Big Blue Boy Scout. By his growing popularity, Metropolis and the world feel the same way. Like Lex, Lois represents Clark's future, his calling reflected by both his allies and his enemies. Lana Lang narrates the final chapter, Winter. We met her in the spring, saw her as a teenager in love with Clark, and felt her anguish as she realized Clark was not proposing to her and never would. She represents both his past and the future Clark gave up to accept his calling as Superman. He could have led an adult life in Smallville, happy with Lana and with all the safety and warmth of his childhood. He had no qualms though about choosing Metropolis instead and even though Smallville is proud of their local boy's name printed regularly in the Daily Planet, Clark made a solid break from their way of life. Like Lois in Metropolis, Lana stands in for Smallville. When Clark regains her friendship, he regains the fortitude and confidence in who he is and what he stands for as he flies through the skies of the city of tomorrow. Now that we've mapped out the larger structure of the story, let's look at its individual components, the text and the art. Loeb deftly handles the language fully embodying the voice of each character. Jonathan Kent uses words and phrases like folks and stubborn as a mule and often drops the subjects from his sentence altogether in a colloquial small town manner. Lois, a reporter, uses strong active verbs and quotes or underlines for emphasis. Lex, a corporate businessman, speaks in short matter-of-fact sentences. And finally, Lana writes with the intimate stream of consciousness one might find in a diary. As for the art, Tim Sale's work can only be described as epic. Always a fan of the one to two page spreads, he places them every few pages in Superman for all seasons. Rarely, in fact, does any page appear with more than three panels. The art draws us into the universe with rich and warm tones. In Smallville, they're the colors of nature. In Metropolis, they are the colors of an Art Deco architecture, because Metropolis is a nature. It's a world man made for himself, and where Clark goes to find and make the nature of his future. Some readers react negatively to the character design of Superman himself. He towers over all other characters, and his square jaw is enlarged in proportion. The genius of the design, though, is that dressed as Clark Kent, one might mistake him for husky or overweight. But in the Superman costume, his muscles are clearly defined. The point is to make Clark look awkward, trying to pass as a normal teenager in Smallville. Not until he faces a tornado in a two-page spread does he begin to look natural to his environment flying through the sky to save a neighbor and to help his parents rebuild their barn. The art emphasizes what Clark realizes in the scene, his calling to use his gifts to help others, his metaphorical place in the world. From that point on, whether flying with Lana over the fields of Smallville or soaring through the cityscape of Metropolis, he appears natural and at one with his surroundings. The lines of the ground or of the city's architecture even mirror his poses and the lines on his clothing. Sale shows Clark's natural habitat to be his heroic work. Visually, his flights through Metropolis are grounded in his upbringing in Smallville. There's much more to be said about Superman for all seasons. Environmental disasters, two natural and one unnatural, serve as catalysts for key turns in Clark's character development. The designs for Lana, Lois, and Lex also speak to different facets of Clark's story. I'd love to hear your thoughts, though. 
Tell me what you think in the comments below about these aspects or others. And tell me also what films or comic runs you'd like to appear next on the channel. Please like and subscribe and share with friends on social media and keep digging deeper into the comics and films you love. Thanks for watching. Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale were both very taken with Frank Miller's Batman Year One. Far more so, they say, than, than his Dark Knight Returns, which was you know, the big deal and all of that. And I completely agree with them. Year One is, is really great stuff. And uh, so they wanted to kind of add on to that continuity. And that was the whole point of Legends of the Dark Knight. That title was supposed to be Batman in his early years anyway. So this was this made perfect sense. So the real work of The Long Halloween is to introduce Harvey Dent in his transition from Harvey Dent to Two-Face. So that's the, where this story falls in terms of continuity wise. But there's just so much good here. I just, I don't even know where to begin. So <laughs> first of all, if you've never read The Long Halloween, much of it will be very familiar to you because it's such an influential work. It influenced Christopher Nolan greatly, although he did not, did not at all <laughs> make a film version of this story, which I think would have been wonderful. He definitely stole a lot of plot points and a lot of little storylines from it, specifically in The Dark Knight uh, film. So so a lot, of the, a lot of those little elements will be familiar. I tell my students all the time. They also, we talked a little bit last time, we mentioned it briefly because I said we cover it in, in length, at length this time. The art is am amazing. The art is very film noir. It's not in black and white. It is in color, but even so, the tones are very cool, blue, and gray. And there's those brilliant, every time a murder happens, suddenly the page is black and white, except for the red blood, which is a great touch. So, they really are playing with playing with some great stuff there, and a lot of that credit goes to Gregory Wright, who we've already seen this this month with the covers to the Batman Never War, Nevermore series that uh, that we looked at in a previous video, which was the Batman Edgar Allan Poe team up, and Gregory Wright did the beautiful covers for that. So he's the colorist here. So you've got Tim Sale, and I've gone on ad nauseum about how much I love Tim Sale's work and the way he stylizes Batman in his universe. So the, Tim Sale doing some amazing, uh, both the penciling and the inking, and then you have Gregory Wright laying over this wonderful film noirish coloring over everything. So just a wonderful effect there. What I'd really like to talk about in this review, though, is just how well of a, and how literary even, of a story this really is. So I've talked a lot in previous videos, too, about how Batman at his core archetype is a detective, is a gothic detective, and that means something, and, and he should be told, uh, story should be told about him in a certain way because of that. And they really understood it here in this tale and in all of Loeb and Sale's work, really. So he's a detective archetype. And, you know, the detective story originated with Edgar Allan Poe and his Monsieur Auguste Dupin and a few of his uh, stories there, Murders of the Rue Morgue and so forth. And those were just really logic problems that Poe was providing for his readers in the, in the magazines that he edited and such. But Arthur Conan Doyle took the whole idea and took the basic setup of those tales and created them and, and placed more narrative in them and really fleshed out the idea of the detective story. So we have that, but then in the 20s and 30s in America, the hard-boiled detective came around. And this is right around the same time that, that Batman's coming around, coming out of the pulp magazines with, with the characters like the Shadow and the Spider and Black Bat and so forth. So very much tied to the detective archetype, but specifically this hard-boiled detective archetype. And there are some differences. So for example, Batman and the old great Batman 66 show with Adam West and Burt Ward, that's a little bit more of a of a traditional detective story because you've got your 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 detective who's a little eccentric, he dresses up like a bat, right? And he's so brilliant though, he's an amazing detective, and he's got a sidekick who isn't quite as brilliant as, as the main detective, who would be Robin here, or sometimes Commissioner Gordon if he's in the room or whatever, or Chief O'Hara or whatever. But they, they you need a sidekick to kind of bridge the audience to the detective and his brilliance and the way he's sort of a little bit a little bit out there. Uh, now, of course, you know, Batman 66 was theater of the absurd as well, so that complicates the whole thing, but that's just a general idea. So you can have Batman stories that are in that traditional detective story archetype, and we see that everywhere today. I mean, certainly Sherlock Holmes and Watson, and we've seen it in, in all kinds of um, detective stories in television shows from Monk to Psych to 
the mentalist and, and all kinds of things. The, the detective has to be a little eccentric or a little out there in some way, maybe lacking in some social skills. And Batman's like that. Batman doesn't lack in social skills. He's brilliant. Bruce Wayne. He can play the brilliant socialite very well. But the fact that he far prefers to, to be alone in his Batcave, you know, down below the ground, you know, doing his his mission that he's uh, that he's so fixated on. And this was the story that really started that too. This is the story that really uh, took that idea of him making a promise to his parents. It didn't originate here, but they really drew that out and, and made it a strong, strong element that I think Chris Nolan picked up on as well, and uh, as well as the makers of some of the Arkham games and stuff. I mean, so much has come from so many great things we have about Batman today we wouldn't have without this title, without the Jeff Loeb, Tim Sale, Batman stories in general, but specifically the Batman, The Long Halloween. So let me try and get back on focus here. <laughs> he, Batman comes from the hard-boiled detective archetype even more directly. And the hard-boiled archetype is usually someone who works alone, and Batman has worked alone. He's also worked with many different people. But in these early stories from the Legends of the Dark Knight, he was working alone. He would just have a contact with Commissioner Gordon. And in these stories, hard-boiled detective stories specifically, the police are just really powerless, either because they're just incompetent or corruption or whatever. And in Gotham City, the case is certainly corruption, right? So that's the issue there. And the hard-boiled detective is out there restoring boundaries in, in, in a city or in a world or in a society or whatever that everything's crumbling and there's no definite boundaries between justice and revenge or right and wrong, safety and danger. It's just everything's sort of crumbling into chaos. You have a hard-boiled detective come in who's going to restore these boundaries and do what only he can do. And this is what we have Batman for. Now, Loeb and Sale don't just tell Batman in this story as a typical film noir, horrible detective story, and just leave it in sort of a trite cliche like that at all. They really flesh it out, because in this story, we have a MacGuffin. If you never heard the term MacGuffin, that's just bandied about quite a bit. It was really, I think, coined by Alfred Hitchcock. There was an old joke, as Hitchcock tells it, where I believe it was a two men on a train to London, and one man has this huge gun in his lap, this weird-looking gun, and, one, and the other man says to him, what is that? And he says, oh, this is a MacGuffin. And uh, he said, what's a MacGuffin? He says, well, MacGuffin's used to, to, shoot in, to shoot elephants. And the other man says, well, there are no elephants in, in London. And the other guy says, oh, well, I guess it's not a MacGuffin then. Um, stupid kind of silly joke. But the point is, it doesn't matter what the MacGuffin is, so long as the MacGuffin's there. Uh, I know that doesn't really make a lot of sense, but let me explain. So, so Hitchcock, for example, would always have his characters in his movies very intent on a certain purpose or their whole thing that drives the plot is to find out who killed this person or to clear the guy's name, you know, or something like that. You know, for example, in Psycho, the money, the money that Janet Lee's character steals in the beginning, that's the MacGuffin. Because by the end of the story, you realize, actually, the movie's not really about the money. Who cares about the money? The money sinks in the river and the lake anyway. No one ever finds it. The story's really about Norman Bates and, and the hotel and are, is he going to be caught and is he going to be stopped and it's really about his story and, and what's happening to him and how he's doing all of this so that's the idea of a MacGuffin and why would you have a MacGuffin well it's because it can add suspense it can add a lot of layers it's a little bit of misdirection to your audience so that you can really do a lot of work behind the scenes and develop some some psychological overtones and suspense and that's what a good film noir film does or should do anyway so they really bring this this element in. There is a MacGuffin in the Long Halloween, and I'm trying. I'm not going to ruin it for you if you've never read it, but I will give you a little bit of analysis here because I just can't help myself. I love this work so much, and I'm used to talking about it and really picking apart picking it apart in depth with my students. So you have this holiday killer is is a mysterious. We don't know who the holiday killer is, and it's somebody who is committing a murder on every single holiday. And there's some ideas, they think it's this person or this person, and Harvey Dent is uh, working with Commissioner Gordon and Batman, and they're trying to find this person. But in the end, you realize that the identity of the holiday killer is the MacGuffin, because you don't even really have a firm, definite answer of who it was in the end. You can kind of piece together some some strands of, of evidence and stuff like that, and okay, this person, this is, I won't give it away, but... That, that's the MacGuffin. It really doesn't matter because the story is truly about Harvey Dent and his descent into his uh, his own personal madness into becoming Two-Face and then how that affects the people around him and specifically the city as well and Batman and Batman's mission and how this affects Batman going forward. So the whole Batman universe. And it's a wonderful story that really takes this character of Two-Face and 
develops him and makes him something that he hasn't really been before. Now, the Batman the Animated Series and their wonderful Two-Face, two-part, I do believe that came out before this. That was 90, like 92, 94, or something like that when the series started, and, and this series began in 96. Uh, this, these stories were first published anyway. So Two-Face did have a more serious and in-depth treatment in the Batman Animated Series already. But this one took it a little bit farther with a little bit more depth that you can bring for a, for a longer written story. And Two-Face is a great character because any villain should mirror the hero in some sort of way. And Two-Face does that. You know, the Joker mirrors Batman. Batman's all about order and self-control and justice and the bat and the joker's total chaos right he's the antithesis of all of that and so that's like a typical kind of you know mirror uh, polar opposite idea of hero and villain but two-face is interesting because two-face is kind of part part batman and almost part joker and i think that's something that they they really dwell on nicely here in jeff Loeb and tim sales batman and it's something chris nolan did quite well developing in the dark knight even though Nolan isn't really telling a detective story, sadly, with that with that film. But Two-Face is failing at resolving the conflict within himself. And it's the same conflict, in a way, that Batman has within himself. He's two people as well. He's wealthy, socialite, playboy, billionaire Bruce Wayne. And he's the, the Dark Knight of Gotham City. And the, the one who's out there working hard and very serious for, for vengeance. And he's always having a little bit of trouble reconciling the two and, and deciding how much time to spend on one and the other. And Batman stories are always trying to delve into that aspect of who is he really? Is he really Batman or is he really Bruce Wayne? And then that was something that Nolan was very focused on and, and kind of obsessed over in a lot of his films. He likes those identity issues. I personally think that the Batman stories work best when they take the approach that the Tim Burton Batman films took. And I talk about that with my students too, because I show that they Burton's Batman is not bisected. He's not two people in there. He's not Bruce Wayne and Batman. He's one whole person with these multiple sides and they come out in different ways. And I cite, for example, the wonderful scene when he goes to Vicki Vale's apartment to tell her what the intent of telling her that he's Batman. Uh, he doesn't because the Joker shows up and kind of foils his plan there. But you see these different facets to him come out in this conversation that he has with Vicki Vale because he's nervous, right? He doesn't know how to tell her that he's Batman. He does uh, like her and he doesn't want to scare her off at the same time. He wants to be honest and he's never done this before. This is new to him. So you see him as, as a little unsure and maybe a little anxious, but then uh, at times you see the Batman really come through. At one point he just kind of pushes her down on the couch and says, look, you're a really nice person. I like you now, but right now I need you to shut up because I need to tell you something. <laughs> That's just such a great moment. And you have all these little uh, hints and that just makes a character far more profound and far more interesting i think than just having somebody who's a divided type of personality i think that's kind of a cheap way out sometimes not that that can't be interesting but again i think that's kind of the the lazy writer's way to approach something when they it's far more interesting if you as a writer can integrate the character and i personally think batman works best like that so that's batman in the long halloween again i could just sit here and talk for a flip an hour, <laughs> if not more, about this book specifically. But I told myself, again, that for these reviews, I don't want to ruin them. I don't want to give in-depth analysis so much as give reviews that people can go and, and look for. I will say that the story is all about Halloween. Obviously, it's in the title. It does follow throughout an entire year, but it begins in Halloween. So you got the Halloween imagery and the Halloween theme all the way through it. It's definitely one of the canon pillar Batman titles. So if you are a Batman fan... This is one of the books that you just need to have read, <laughs> really. It's, it's so amazing, and it's easily available anywhere. You can find it digitally on Comixology and Amazon. You can find it in the wonderful paperback cover I have here. I'd like to get a nice hardback cover of it eventually.